Yeah, you can have my guy when I'm done with him. <laughs> All right, hello everyone. My name is Chris Thompson. I'm the founder of Share Token Tech Talks. We're back in uh, September after a short summer off. Um, so we're going to try something new this fall. So we're going to do the Tech Talks tonight in September. We're going to take October off because I don't feel like doing it. Uh, we're going to be back in November. Then we're going to take December off because it's the holidays. We're back in January. We'll probably take February off. If you pick it up with some of the themes, we're going to do it every two months basically. Uh, for those of you bad at now. Um, and I am looking for a present, I'm looking for two more presenters, actually for November. Uh, so if there are any repeat offenders that want to present again, uh, that could be good. Uh, I think Brian actually uh, offered to present in November. So Brian definitely <laughs> shake his head. Brian will be presenting in November on the topic to be determined. Um, yeah, so if you have something you're interested in presenting, if it's a technology, if it's something about your profession that you want to share, or you have a side project, then please kind of get at me and, uh, and we'll put you on the list to present. Uh, so we've got four very talented presenters tonight, uh, one repeat offender, so that's pretty good. I try and only have one person who has presented previously come back and kind of give us an update so we can have fresh blood, because uh, there's a lot of people in the community that I'd really love to hear what they do for a living. Uh, we've got a very uh, vibrant and growing tech scene here, but there's a lot of people that work remote, or they work for other companies, or they have their own work from home offices. Uh, and I really, the idea of this, is share, idea of share token, is really to kind of bring everybody together and share different things that we do, we're working on in this area. Uh, so anyone who's been here before uh, knows that I kind of like to go through some of the, the meetup milestones. So, uh, so September, as of last week, uh, we celebrated our second uh, year as a tech talk. Uh, so we're now going to our third year. Uh, pretty strong. So we have, yeah. Woo! Woo! Uh, uh, if you are not part of the meetup group yet, subscribe to that. If you don't follow us on Twitter, subscribe to that. That's the only way you ever hear about these events. Uh, so we do no other kind of marketing. Uh, and yet in January, we usually bring out 75, 85 people on a Wednesday night. Uh, so that's pretty impressive, and I appreciate when that, that comes out. So uh, as of this month, we have uh, 792 members of our meetup group. That's up from uh, 697 uh, last May. Uh, so over the summer, I kept getting all these pings on my, my meetup app, uh, just new people joining. And I said, well, look, we're getting a lot of people that are involved in the New York tech scene that are liking our group. So is there anyone in the audience tonight that lives in New York? New York City. New York City. Okay. That kind of dumb uh, so that's good. So I, I don't know what started to pick it up. Uh, I know that when I go to meetups down in New York, then uh, I get people on the, the sign up saying, oh, you're part of all these uh, Sarah these upstate events. Uh, are you from there? I said, yeah, I'm from there. What are you doing down here? Well, I come down for the day. Like, that's what we do when we meet upstate. We're down in New York. So, um, so that's pretty exciting. Uh, so we're at uh, 577 yeah, Twitter followers of uh, yeah. at Sharatoga Tech. Again, if you don't follow it, Please follow it. I send out good announcements about other tech meetups and other things going on here at Upstate. It's really the only way, uh, kind of word of mouth, that a lot of us get these events out. Uh, so yeah, so 577 twin followers. Uh, that's up from 537, so things keep growing. Uh, our YouTube, so we have 23 YouTube channel subscribers. Anyone that knows from the previous events? We had 22 at the last event. We had 21 of the month before that, we had 20 of the month before that, and we had 21. So basically, we lost one and we gained it back, so now we're up the last one. So I'm pretty excited about that. <laughs> Somebody's watching my videos. Uh, we've had 37 new views of videos in the last four months, so I appreciate those, those people that view those. Uh, we are recording tonight's meetup. If you don't want to be on film, don't come up here unless you're Max. Uh, so we will record Max's video. It may or may not go up on the site. Max may or may not drop some things tonight that we don't want to share publicly yet. Uh, so I reserve the right to hold that uh, as back. So we're also using the hashtag uh, Saratoga Tech. So if you tweet anything, which I strongly encourage, Andy, I know you're going to always promote it. So uh, uh, please uh, use uh, hashtag Saratoga Tech. Uh, so uh, first pre our first presenter tonight is, uh, is Gordon. He's going to do a presentation. It's not really this title, but developing face recognition and speaker verification for mobile devices. So this should be a really light on tech, I'm sure. Gordon. Thank you, Chris. All right, yes, so um, I'm Gordy Haupt, and um, I work at a company called Sensory, and I'm the Senior Director of Vision Technologies there. And I'm going to talk a little bit about Change the title slightly, but uh, certainly that was the gist of it. Um, talking about mobile authentication using face and voice, and uh, efforts to make passwords go away, whether it's passwords or 
We're trying to make that uh, effort go away. All right, just a quick background about myself. I did my doctorate at Stanford, um, and uh, back backgrounds in engineering, signal processing, computer vision. That's always been my focus um, throughout my career. Um, early on as an individual contributor, and later as a manager and director. Um, and uh, while I was on the Bay Area for quite a while, I moved to um, New York just a couple years ago um, to Saratoga. And uh, I lived in the Bay Area for quite a while before that. And I was in a number of Bay Area startups in biotech, uh, e-commerce for a little while. I was in a, a dot-com at, at the height of the dot-com boom out in Silicon Valley. The company got $10 million in funding for a ridiculous reason, just as everybody was getting at that time. Um, but this, you know, you gotta remember this is a time when we thought that we needed five online pet stores, which turned out to be the wrong answer. None was actually the right answer. The number of online pet stores we needed. Um, oh, yeah, that'd be great. Joined Sensory. So Sensory is um, a company that was founded in 1994, actually, so we're 22 years old. So the term startup is probably a stretch at this point for your Sensory. Um, as you might imagine, the company is 22 years old, has uh, had some ups and downs, we've had some successes and some, some uh, failures, but we're still going and have some really interesting technology. We are um, headquartered in the Bay Area, we have a uh, pretty sizable office in Portland, Oregon. And then, uh, now I've grown the team into what we call that, and I'll talk about that. Uh, so our, our focus as a company for all this time has been on speech technologies. Um, speaker verification, speech recognition, text-to-speech, all focused on consumer electronics. We're in a lot of toys, we're in a lot of uh, Bluetooth headsets, things like that, most recently in smartphones, and in particular, um, our truly hands-free technology which is um, a voice trigger for smartphones. And you may be familiar with this if you get an Android phone. A lot of Android phones, mine is not, but a lot of them have a, uh, a trigger that you can say, like, OK, Google Now, which will wake up your phone, and then you can say, OK, Google Now, what's the temperature in Saratoga? That trigger that's always on, always listening, very low power, minimize the false sounds you don't want to trigger all the time, that's us, you know, most Android phones. So that's the technology we develop. We've, so we're very focused on the combination of signal processing, but low power, low footprint applications. And so most recently I joined the company in 2013, three years ago, with the idea to create a computer vision team to complement our speech technologies, to look for products that we can do that work together. And in particular, we've been focused on space authentication using speech, uh, or, sorry, authentication using face recognition, speaker verification. So just a little background, uh, I'll be able to probably hear about this, but this is the reason that we started this whole thing. It's, it's the reason that other things exist, like Touch ID as well. I'll talk about that. But passwords, pins, patterns suck. We all know that, and especially except when you're on a phone, it's extremely hard to type a password. Ideally, your password should be complex, right? There's supposed to be 12 or more characters. It's supposed to have uppercase, lowercase, numbers, symbols. I'm sure everyone's password looks exactly like that. No one is using the password as their password. If you are, you should change it. By the way, this is not much better, actually. It looks a little better, but it doesn't make much difference. It's really just about as crappy at this point. Um, ideally, your password should never be reused, right? You're supposed to use a new password for every account. But if you are in the digital age at this point, you probably have tens, maybe hundreds of accounts, which are all supposed to have a different password. You're supposed to change them every three months, by the way. That's a good rule as well. So obviously, you cannot be remembering all of them, typing them all in. It's just unmanageable. And you shouldn't be posting them somewhere or putting them down. So people to find, obviously, as well. Pins aren't a whole lot better. Most of them fall into one, two, three, four, or some sequence, or four of the same digit, or your birth date. All of those are easily guessable. Um, patterns aren't a whole lot better either. Almost everybody, it turns out, starts out in the upper left corner when you're doing a pattern on your Android phone. Um, <coughs> I see a lot of people are probably going to change things tonight, maybe. Um, so a lot of problems. You can do some things right now. Um, use LastPass or Password Manager is a very good idea. It, um, you can then do all those password rules, complex passwords, change them all the time, that kind of thing. 
all the managers under one uh, uh, master password and does auto filling and so that works pretty well. Um, and you also should use second factor authentication. Any app that you can that allows you to have your phone as a backup. So when you log in somewhere else, it texts your phone, gives you a code. You've probably seen this. You should. You know, if your bank does not have this, you should use another bank. You really should be using second factor. So. But that's a big nuisance, there's a lot of stuff to do, and so we're trying to hopefully make that easier. Um, hopefully biometrics is running to the rescue. Now, you're probably familiar with Touch ID, um, Apple's uh, fingerprint uh, technology. Samsung has fingerprint on their phones as well, it's been the recent ones in the last couple of years. Um, the first ones that came out were pretty dicey, uh, but it works pretty well now. Actually, it's pretty good. There's conditions under which it doesn't work, and all biometrics struggle with various um, pluses and minuses, including our space and voice, of course. Um, there's also Iris Sense, and just came out with, I think on their note, they have uh, Iris recognition, um, which is pretty interesting. It's very, it has the potential for very high accuracy, but it's also um, pretty intrusive. You have to hold it up pretty high, and so that's an easy to use. So our focus on the face of voice has been on ease of use. And if you don't have ease of use, you're not going to get consumer adoption. So that's really been our idea. There's all, there are also others. Um, there are ear biometrics that are out there. Um, although actually, oddly enough, in with modern phones, um, raising your phone to your ear is now not a natural thing to do, it turns out. Um, but it is, a, it is a biometric that exists. Um, eye vein, uh, palms, uh, behavioral biometrics. It's really interesting type of how you type, how you type on your phone, how you hold it, how you use it. There are people who are doing biometrics around that as well. It's a sort of a softer biometric in the sense that it's not a necessarily one time uh, or a immediate uh, atomic sort of action that's going to happen over time, but uh, also interesting biometrics. So I do want to talk a little bit about what we're doing in sensory. We call it truly secure. Um, it's our face recognition and speaker verification combined. Um, as I said before, a lot of our focus has been on ease of use, making it very easy, very fast, very convenient. One of the things that we thought um, was really uh, useful about this and that works well is that it's very intuitive. Um, I made fun of the ear biometric, but um, talking to your phone and looking at your phone are pretty simple, intuitive things for people to do. Uh, so we try to use that and try to make the user experience operate within that sort of realm. Not uh, have you do something special. You have to hold it up really close to your face, that kind of thing. Make it as simple as possible. Um, and the nice, the nice thing about this also, it doesn't require special hardware, so it works across all phones. So our partners, if we go out, go out with a bank, let's say, financial is, a, is certainly a uh, a big area for this. Um, they want to roll out across everybody's phones. Hopefully, they do iOS and Android. They don't want just the Android side. They want all Android phones, not just the Samsung ones and fingerprint. And so we can do this across any phone. Any smartphone that has a reasonably good camera, a reasonably good mic, which is at this point any phone in the last few years. So, uh, except for those of you with flip phones, probably have a problem. But, uh, I think that only applies to my father-in-law. I'm pretty sure. But, uh, <laughs> So another thing we've really worked on from a software standpoint, um, and my team is, is focused on making the SDK extremely easy to use. So from a partner standpoint, people will work with, and actually I said banks, for example, but we typically don't work directly with a bank. We would work with another company, a sort of security-focused company that would integrate our technology into their security architecture and bring that into the bank for their app that's going to go you know, or their website, whatever combination of those things. Um, and so we wanted to make that as easy. Possible. Um, so the SDK is our product. That's what we sell, and we license that into, um, as I said, other partners of ours. We actually do have an app on the Play Store. If you're interested, you're uh, welcome to go try it out. It's um, called AppLock. There are a ton of apps called AppLock. It turns out. So if you search AppLock Sensory, you'll find app, our AppLock. Um, and basically, what it does is it you can use it to lock other apps on your phone. So if you want to, if you set it up in this way, you go to open your Facebook app. As your Facebook app opens up, our app jumps in front of it, waits to see your voice, hear your voice, or see your face, and then lets you in. Um, and so, uh, it's it's uh, a demonstration of our technology, not our product, as I say. But it's kind of fun to play with, and it could be somewhat useful depending on how you use your phone. So you could potentially, we, we actually have uh, over 100,000 downloads at this point, and we have. Uh, I was just talking to um, the guys this morning. Um, we have over. Four, almost five million authentications have been done using our app. So people putting their face or their voice, usually the face, actually, most people use their face for the stuff. But um, five million times over the course of a couple of years, and we've had people authenticate that. 
right? So we've gotten a lot of use. It's been great. It's a great, um, actually, uh, analysis for us to reanalyze the data, see how it's working, feeds back into our user experience, or what things like that. So, um, and very easy to use. That's the first idea. So I wanted to take just a, at the end here, just a brief aside and talk about deep learning. That's what we're using as part of our algorithm for um, for our face recognition and speaker verification. You may have heard of deep learning, but that'd be fun to just kind of talk about it briefly. Um, deep learning's been in the news, but it's, it's basically a um, kind of state of the art for a lot of what used to be computer, computer vision applications are now going to deep learning, face recognition, certainly one of them. Um, you may have heard about it, uh, Google and Facebook have both talked about their uh, uh, deep learning algorithms for face recognition. They, they've uh, had headlines sort of announcing sort of comparable to human or better than human face recognition. They usually work on a, a data set called Label Faces in the Wild, which is uh, a very large data set of just uh, celebrities and pictures that are very wide angles and, and very hard to uh, recognize. And their performance on this has been very good with their deep learning approaches. Um, also, a few months back, um, uh, there was uh, Google's DeepMind, their AlphaGo program, um, uh, had a match against uh, the world champion for Go. And I, I don't know how to play Go, but it was still fascinating even for me as a machine learning guy to follow the, the whole. Uh, and AlphaGo defeated him pretty soundly, as I recall, so it was pretty interesting. Um, Go is arguably, I think if I remember, it's arguably a more challenging um, uh, from an AI standpoint than chess, which you, know, you might hear about chess programs. So, um, so that's, that's what deep learning has been in the news. Just briefly, basically what's going on is deep learning is um, essentially ends up being a, a model of a, a, what's it, like a neural network, an artificial neural network. So that term has been around for about 20, 30 years. Um, and deep learning is really the, sort of the latest variant of artificial neural networks. And basically what happens is you've got your input, in our case, pictures of faces, for example, right? And you want to classify them on your end as who is this person? I want to compare them to someone else, or I want to find the best set of features in order to use in the future to, clear, to compare this person against other people. How do I distinguish this person from other people? What are the distinguishing features? And what you do is you have a ton of data. It always depends on a ton of data, which is why Google and Facebook are very good at this. Uh, you have a ton of data, you train it over and over again with, with examples. And, and during the training, these nodes in the middle are actually weights. And these weights get modified by various algorithms over time, so that over time, this space gets mapped into the right set of things that you, that you want for the best results. So with all this training data, you run it and run it and run it until it works really well, and you say, okay, that's my, that's my algorithm, now I use new data and I put it out there on phones and it's going to work well. Assuming I have good training data, it will work very well for people out there. It will do a good job of distinguishing who's who. Okay. So, um, any oops, yeah, I went too far. Well, you saw, you may have seen very briefly that there's a little picture of a brain. Point being that the neural nets are similar to the architecture of the human brain in some ways. It's very similar to taking inputs. The process through a lot of layers, basically, and different different filtering and things that go on to get concepts or ideas or whatever that comes out. And so the neural nets are, in that sense, a model. So my last slide, slide so thank you. So thank you. Questions? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the deal is we don't let anybody off the stage until we've had three questions from the audience. <laughs> What is it like for voice? Yeah. What is deep learning like for voice? Um, so it's, uh, it's it's very similar. Yeah. So I did show the face. Um, it's basically the same idea. So the voice signal voice signals are an audio signal is basically a one dimensional signal compared to face. So face is a you have a picture of face, right? So there's two dimensions there, um, and you're looking at the pixels, the values of the pixels. And actually, you look at the pixels, there's three dimensions of color assigned. So so they're basically that's the data set that's going in. In the voice side, it's a one dimensional waveform. You may have seen you've probably seen. Um, there's uh, cartoonish versions of what voice looks like sometimes when you're speaking or whatever, it's kind of a waveform. That's what, that's what the sound is, it's a waveform. So what you're doing is you're taking the waveform of your voice and your passphrase, um, comparing it to the passphrase that's enrolled, and also saying someone else who says your passphrase on the phone, making sure it's not the same. So we're looking at, you know, in, in at the end, it's going to be looking at, in some sense, the frequencies involved and things like that. But rather than doing it explicitly, which is the way 
classic computer vision, or in this case, uh, speech processing technologies work, is they look, they do frequency analysis, or wavelength analysis, or what have you, all these computer vision techniques. Instead of doing that, you let the neural net figure it out. And so you don't end up knowing, I, I skipped this point, but you don't really know what those features are in the end that are the, the salient things that describe the face, but you know that it works well because you've got a lot of data and then you test the actual genes and you have a separate set of data that you then run as your, as your test data, but not your training data. So I don't know if I'm answering your question there, but for voice, it's, it's similar in that it's a, a signal, but it's a simpler signal in some ways, one dimensional. Same idea, you put lots of examples in and say, this is, this is a match, this is a match, this one's not. And you, the neural net, figure out how to separate them out. What are the best features that will put them into their own space so that everything that is you lives over here close to each other? You know, you might say it a little differently from one type of how many How many people do you have in each of your offices? You in San Francisco, Portland, and Yeah, um, she was asking about sensory, how many people. Um, so we have about 60 people total, and uh, there are about 15, I would say, in Santa Clara. Um, that team is mostly focused on the DSP sort of side, the, very, uh, the, the work that we do for the like, truly hands free, where we're uh, putting it on to very low power DSPs, like I said. Uh, there's a, a 20, 25 maybe in Portland, and um, they are mostly speech technologists, a lot of researchers. We have, of the 60 people, we probably have half, half PhDs and like that. So there's a lot of researchers. They're very, very algorithm focused. Uh, and so, so the speech people are in Portland, and then Boulder is mostly my team, the vision team, um, and uh, a couple others, and then there's a few stragglers like myself who happen to be working out of the house here in New York. So, oh, I didn't hear that there was a Boulder office, too. Yeah, oh, so okay. the Boulder office was most recent, and, and that's that's what started in 2013 when I joined. It just turned out that we were hiring someone else that uh, was also at the same time, and it made sense to build the team there, even though I was in the Bay Area at the time, which you know, was kind of what allowed me to move to New York and still work in Boulder, actually, so mm -hmm. still did that. Yeah. Are you using it on a regular basis on your normal phone? Um, I do, um, I don't use the, the app lock that much on my phone. Um, I've used it a fair amount of course, uh, as you might imagine, just testing and stuff like that. Um, the reason I don't, it, it sort of depends on the use case for app lock. Because app lock is kind of a, it's kind of funky because it's, um, in, the, in the real case, where if our real product is this SDK, right? That would get built into, say, your banking app. Right. And then as you go to log into your banking app, instead of typing in your password, you would use your face or voice. So right now, if I go into my banking app, and if I locked it with AppLock, I would have to show my face or voice, and the app would come up and it would ask for my password. So it doesn't help a whole lot. With Facebook, it works because I have my password entered and it's permanent, and so Facebook just opens up every time. But I don't really care that much if somebody gets into my Facebook, so I, so I, don't, I don't actually use AppLock a lot myself. But we do have people, we have people who, have, who have authenticated over 20,000 times, or uh, 10 or 20 users who have used it over 20,000 times they, they looked into their phone. Lots of people use it hundreds of thousands of times. So I think, I think if you're in a situation maybe where you're, um, uh, you have a phone that is shared in the family or something like that to some extent, maybe you, know, you want to keep your mom from seeing your Facebook or something that maybe makes sense. So it's, I think there are some use cases, but uh, again, it's, it's more for us. That's more of a demonstration of a technology than a product. We don't charge for it. Just, you know. yeah. Does does the app like? Uh, all, all the information that it's storing and, and authenticating, is that client only or is it kind of risk while well it's sending yeah. a blob out and getting yeah. something back? No, very good question. Because um, you, you can hack that, right? So yeah. you can interpret the blob and say, ooh, I can get into their stuff. It's a good question. There's, there's a big, um, it's, it's kind of a religious thing where it's either you're in the cloud or you're on device. There are two options for it. So the question is, where, where is the authentication happening? Where is anything going on? There, there, there really, there's two ways. You can do it in the cloud. You can, you can stream audio or video, whatever you need, up to the cloud, run it on a server, send it back down. Pluses and minuses to that um, versus on device. We are on device. So, okay. so, and it fits with Sensory's sort of background. We're, we've always been very focused on the low power, low constrained situations. Well, smartphones aren't too low power at this point. They're, they're pretty strong processors, but it still has a constrained. Yeah, but you're not using radio then. Sorry? So you're not using radio then, and it is cheap. Right? Yeah. That's true. So, and there's no broadcast over there. From a security standpoint, um, the nice thing about being on the phone is that your biometrics never leave your phone. Your bank doesn't store your biometrics. Google doesn't store your biometrics. A lot of people prefer that, certainly. Um, other nice thing is that from an attack standpoint, it can be harder to secure the phone in some ways because you can do a lot of things on a server to secure it. 
but it's a much less uh, attractive target. Because if I get into your phone, I only get your stuff. Right. But if I break into Yahoo and I get 500 million email addresses, that's kind of interesting. I can sell those for a while. So because the attacks are so much greater on the server, we feel strongly about the local um, on device. But it, it's, it's got its pluses and minuses. So people do it both ways. So if it's on the phone, then if you trade in your phone or something, they obviously can wipe it. Oh, yeah. Way, yeah. Yeah, you so can delete the app and it'll so just go away. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. There's, there's a whole so so one of the there's a whole discussion here uh, that's typical in biometrics of accuracy first and how accurate you are distinguishing your face from my face. So you asked about um, uh, images of a face and uh, how do you make sure that somebody doesn't view the picture. Um, and so there's, there's the accuracy side, then there's what's called spoofing. Which basically, and that happens for every biometric. Fingerprints, you've probably heard, you know, they can, they can uh, lift your fingerprint somewhere, they can make a little gel of it, and they put it on the fingerprint sensor, and they can spoof it. Same for all, so they all have this issue, so the face has the issue from the standpoint of pictures, or videos for that matter too, right? Videos are a little bit less easy to find, than they do, but they're still out there, of course. Um, now, um, and so, um, so what you do is basically there's liveness techniques, ways to prove liveness. There's a number of things we do. We combine face and voice first. Also, if you're doing both, you have to have your voice recorded yet, put voice recorded as well as a picture of the face. Um, for people who are just doing face, one of the things we do is a motion-based um, calculation. So we're looking at the image that's in front of us to see if it's three-dimensional. You need to do a little bit of motion, not much, but a little bit of motion that will allow us to confirm that you are three-dimensional person, not a two-dimensional image. Even if you hold the two-dimensional image or move it around, it still moves in the way that a two-dimensional image would, not in the way that a three-dimensional person would. Um, so that's one of the things we do. We have other things that we're working on as well. Uh, it's certainly a big area. That being said, it's, it's, um, it goes back to the security argument about being local, that um, the only thing you're going to get is in your iPhone. So you know, how much work are you going to go to to try to find my image on Facebook? Assuming you know who I am, because you know who you stole it from, hopefully, in that case. Uh, hopefully, it's not my attackers. But um, attackers, for their, for their sake, are hopefully hoping that they know who you are. We have to find your image, hold it up to the, the um, phone, and hopefully get in, only to get your stuff. So it's not a scalable attack. So, But it's moving very real. This question comes up. It's, as much as any, I think it's um, where we would get killed on is the bloggers. Bloggers who will come out and say, well, I spoof the, and everything's spoofable. Fingerprints spoofable, wires, they're all spoofable if you go up more hard in fact. You may have seen the report of uh, how they lifted, I think it was um, uh, Angela Merkel's fingerprint using a camera from you know, like 40 yards away or something like that, with some sort of thing. Okay, they used a lot of technology to do that too. So, And yes, if you got into her account, you might get something interesting. I suppose, and she, assuming she doesn't have an email server, that's, uh, that's a that's it. Um, but, uh, so so it, it's, it's a matter of scale, but, but to answer your question, there are things you do with your lives. Uh, one more question. Oh, sure. yeah. So I had a longer form version inspection. The dirt version inspection is uh, Piano or TensorFlow, which is the, what's the right choice? Uh, it's a good question, and I'm gonna, to some extent, I'm gonna take the fifth as a manager. <laughs> so I'm not actually using either, but we are using TensorFlow. Right. So, I, I, it doesn't seem like it's that widely used in production just yet, but you guys are pretty mature company you're using, so that's good. We're pretty early on, yeah, okay. yeah. And we're, and we're um, so I have um, so come in the, my group in um, Boulder, um, so what he's asking about, just to clarify, are a couple different tools that are available for doing deep learning. TensorFlow is a Google tool. What's it on called? Yano, I think it was what Google used before they wrote their own thing. That sounds familiar. Um, we do use TensorFlow, as I was saying, somewhat. It's a, a tool that's uh, very helpful for um, developing deep learning algorithms. Um, we are, and we have three researchers, and I have three researchers on my team in Boulder, and they're pretty familiar with a lot of controls, so they probably use both, I guess. Again, used to do something else. I'm happy to take more questions afterwards. I have those questions later. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right.
so uh, so it's gonna take us like two minutes ish to kind of switch out of laptops. So maybe it's not time to go. Yeah. All right. So everybody's going to All right. So now we're gonna take a five minute break. This Mac Miller guys got up. So all right. So uh, five minute break, uh, and we'll be back uh, with the beer. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Liam Bowen. I'm co-founder of 10X Developers. We're a small software development consultancy that's based out of Clifton Park, where I'm from, and also Boston, where my business partner is. And I'm here today to talk about a, uh, a software as a service, I guess you could call it, um, that I spend way too much time on. It's open source, but it's, a, it's definitely a passion project of mine. It's called RailsAssets.org. So what is Rails Assets uh, Rails Assets is supposed to be the frictionless proxy between Bundler and Bower. So by a show of hands, how many people have actually used Rails Assets Okay, yeah, uh, no, all right. So uh, how many people have used like Ruby on Rails at all? All right, many, good. So one thing about Ruby on Rails is it's really easy to include a lot of different types of like backend dependencies, like I mean Active Record itself or uh, anything like a, a little gem like uh, Phony would be one example that just formats phone numbers. But including stuff on the front end is a completely different process, and I think that Rails uh, like there are a bunch of different ways to do it, but they're all terrible. And <laughs> So uh, Bower is the front-end package manager that was like, the most popular and still is very popular. Like if you follow the official Angular 1 tutorial, it tells you to install it via Bower. So this thing just bridges the gap so you don't have to use two different package managers for the same thing because hooking up uh, Bower into your Rails project is a very uh, involved process. And it, it usually gives like pretty lousy results. So put more succinctly, this is uh, taken from uh, GitHub issue. Someone said Webpack, which is uh, like it, it does package management and stuff for the front end, is the future boys. And so we got some pretty mixed reviews nine thumbs down, three thumbs up. And then this more enlightened guy, Halilim, on uh, the same day said the problem is we haven't reached that future yet, and we need a hassle free asset management solution right now, which doesn't change every six months. And he got 14 thumbs up, so I think he's right. So the state of the project, it's been around since uh, 2010, and it was maintained by a uh, Polish consultancy called Monterail, and they have uh, a lot of talented developers, and it was uh, fairly well done. And it was hosted by this company called Shelly Cloud. And I happened to stumble upon RailsAssets.org. I didn't uh, start it, but I stumbled upon it uh, through a number of different blogs that said, hey, use this thing if you're using Rails. And the problem was the service was really unreliable. I remember one time during a long weekend, it was down for like 72 hours, and it's like a website. So uh, development can't continue happening when you can't uh, use the thing that installs the things that your program needs to run. So it was just a frustrating experience. Then uh, when it was down, I went on their GitHub, and uh, it turns out that their host, who was hosting this for free, was closing at the end of March of this year. And Montreal's plan was to basically just have like a read-only mode so that you could migrate off of it. And they met a lot of backlash because so many people continued using this, and since it still very much has a place uh, in the development uh, ecosystem with Rails. So as soon as I found this out, I said, I'm just going to take this over and I set up a functioning mirror of it within like a day or two. And by the end of uh, February, the maintainers that owned the domain uh, actually just said I can have it, so that was cool. <laughs> now I'm gonna talk about how, uh, why this was unreliable in the first place and how I made it reliable. So Ruby on Rails is really bad with memory management and you probably know that if you've ever used it. It takes a lot of horsepower to power a Rails app, and a lot of it is just memory. So the really expensive version of Fusion Passenger, which is the application server that runs um, 
that runs a lot of different Rails applications. It's one of the most popular, although I'd probably use Puma if I started again today. It uh, has this thing called passenger memory limit, which just kills off uh, your application. It usually spawns, let, let's say, six workers. And when they get too big, it can kill it off. So I just wrote like a little bit of like, this was just a quick hack to literally just put out a fire so that the server would stay up for you know, more than a day. And this just kills uh, whichever process is too big. So this is obviously not a real solution, but a lot of companies do this in production. In fact, I don't know of any that deploy Rails applications that don't have like some external process that just kills workers that get too big. Uh, but that isn't actually solving the problem. So then I had to go through and figure out what is actually using all this memory. Now, um, on the left here, this is just like a diff of code. So sorry if you uh, hate reading code, but this is just an active record query that makes a JSON file. And it is, uh, the JSON file is 1.3 megabytes. I remember that. And th this four lines of code used 1.1 gigabytes of memory, and that was really hard to track down. So when I figured this out, I was like, why is it using so much memory? And the answer was, I still don't know. But <laughs> instead, what I did was, uh, I just used Postgres's awesome JSON handling capabilities that are built right into it. So if I were looking through the code and I saw like some like big query like this in the code, I would uh, definitely raise an eyebrow, but the difference between these two is absolutely enormous. Like, this just made the application relatively stable within uh, like minutes. So, then uh, next is Sidekick. Sidekick is like my hero. It we use it a lot. We use it for pretty much everything. And one of the uh, easy ways that you can scale any web application is just by doing more things asynchronously. Because if you have like six worker processes or whatever on a server to work with, they can only actually do one thing at a time. They can only handle one request. So it's senseless to use one of those really sort of uh, expensive, valuable processes to do something like send an email. You know, you're blocking everyone from using the site while it's sending an email or whatever for a password reset. So as you can see here, in like 63 days, we actually used, uh, we started 10 million different uh, asynchronous jobs in Sidekick, and it definitely just saves uh, a huge amount of resources by, instead of just doing everything in the web application itself, it just puts it into a queue and then it gets to it when it gets to it. Uh, this is just one example of where we optimize something. This happens to be in the most frequently used code path in the entire application, and they were doing one of the most expensive operations synchronously. And just by changing it to perform async instead of perform, so it's a couple characters change, all of a sudden uh, uh, requests sped up like, uh, I think, well over 50% most of the time for the most common code path. Then the other easy win for scaling any web application is caching. Like you have to do very aggressive caching if you want to serve a lot of users. So there's this really cool thing called action pack page caching. And it used to be in the Rails core, now it's not anymore. But it's really useful to have uh, user specific, or if you don't have user specific content on a page, which is actually kind of uncommon, then uh, you can easily just cache the entire thing and then serve it as a static file. And then it doesn't even hit the application server, it doesn't hit Fusion Passenger, it doesn't run a line of Ruby code, it just serves it directly from Nginx, which is really fast and you can easily serve thousands of thousands and thousands of people simultaneously rather than just like six. Uh, if you like action-packed page caching, there's a bunch of different layers of caching that you can do in Rails. Uh, those include uh, SQL adapter caching, fragment caching, and action caching. And uh, I haven't really seen a lot of people use those, so, uh, but they're out there and they're very useful. So this is another big improvement that we made. Uh, in general, with hosted open source software like this. The infrastructure itself is should be described in code. So when I first like cloned the Git repository for this and went to set up the server, there's a lot of stuff that you have to do. You have to install the web server itself, Nginx. You have to install passwords. You have to wire them up together. Uh, you have to install certificates and distribute SSH keys, set up NFS, database credentials, etc. 
so there's a lot of like stuff to do to just set up a server. And very few projects are actually good with this. It's silly because when you're actually setting this up in real life, you just type things into like a shell. Well, if you just type things into a text file and then run it, that's a shell script and now you can actually automate it. Ansible is like one step up from that. Uh, Ansible is another one of my very favorite things and if you have anything to do with creating software, uh, you should know about it. So with Ansible, you can create uh, YAML files. They're just uh, text files that describe how you want a server to look and then you just run it and then it makes it into that state. So that was a huge time saver, and now when there's something that's actually uh, wrong with a server, uh, someone can open a pull request, just like they can for any other part of the code, and fix it. So now that the service is all reliable and everything, unfortunately the hardware that it runs on is uh, not 100% reliable, and this is going to happen with, with any host. So on May 12th, we had uh, a hardware issue on, we were down all the way down to one server at this time. Uh, there used to be, I think, five servers. We got it down to one. It was very reliable, very fast. And there was a uh, big like hardware issue that affected a lot of different nodes. And so the fact is, it's going to fail at some point. It's not, it's not really a good idea to just try to like, get hardware that's 100% reliable. So the solution that I came up with, it was just really simple, was to just copy everything on the production server to a different server every couple of hours. The server itself doesn't really change that much. It builds new versions of packages that exist and it allows you to add new ones. But that's pretty much it. So in this case, um, all that it does is copy the entire database to a separate server that's in a totally separate data center. And then uh, it moves all the files also. And uh, then the only question that's left is how do you actually fail over? Well, Amazon Web Services has this thing called Route 53, which is their DNS provider. And that has a thing that you can wire up to Amazon Health Checks. So every uh, minute, it just uh, visits the home page of the server, checks to see if it's up. And if it's not, then it uh, flips over to the second one. I tested that once manually. It hasn't actually gone down since. But I think that in the worst possible case, the site would be down for 100 seconds for some people but I don't think that it can actually get any worse than that. So uh, that allows me to actually sleep well at night. All right, so here are some numbers of actual usage. In just August, so last month, we had 8 million HTTP requests from 51,000 users. It's really IP addresses. It's impossible to measure the number of users. We used 124 gigabytes of bandwidth. We served uh, just over half a million Ruby gems. It's got 1,580 GitHub stars, 1,422 commits, 62 different people have contributed to the source, and there has been zero downtime. Uh, special thanks to DigitalOcean. They're really awesome. They actually uh, gave us an enormous amount of credit for uh, using their services, and I gotta say it's uh, been much more enjoyable than using uh, like EC2 or whatever, because it's just a lot simpler and it's very fast, works very well. Sentry also uh, gives us uh, free credit for their service, uh, Arby's, of course, and, and Chris. And everyone who's ever written a line of code, filed an issue, or donated money. And that's it, questions? First, give props uh, because you use stats, which I'm a big fan of reading off stats and things. So, uh, one for that. Uh, and two, can we get a round of applause for dressing up for the tech talk? Thank you so much. <laughs> 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 so, we're going to all the tech to dress up. <laughs> That's what I so, all right, same rule. Three questions before we put them off the stage. So, first up, Max is outside taking care of business, so can't remind these questions. So, somebody else. <laughs> Joe, in the back, I know you've got a dying question about this. I do. All right, fine, Brian. Did you say what Rails Assets uh, actually does? Uh, like what service is it offering for the user? Uh, the service that it's offering for the user is that they don't have to use two different package managers in order to actually get dependency management for all of their front-end uh, dependencies. So for example, if you want to 
put uh, Angular in your project. There are various third-party gems that you can include, but when you have uh, dependencies that rely on Angular, like if you're using a little widget for Angular for uh, select boxes, for example, then that won't know about that, and it's just kind of a mess. Uh, you could, of course, just use Bower itself, but then you have to. S there's a lot of legwork involved in like setting that up. So this just turns it into a Ruby gem that you include just like any other, and uh, it injects it directly into the Rails assets pipeline, which does all kinds of awesome optimizations to make your site fast. Awesome. Next question. Come on. Yes. How would you summarize this to a kindergartner? <laughs> <laughs> Great question. Love it. Um, I I don't know. Um, <laughs> uh, really simple is I wanted this presentation to be about more like uh, how to set up a reliable service or how to host something well. Uh, so that was the point of it. The, uh, the summary of that is you can't rely on any one particular thing to do anything other than just fail at some point. So uh, strengthen numbers, I guess. Strengthen like redundancy of the services. How would I sum up uh, Rails assets itself? Um, I, I would probably say uh, I don't know, major in, major in English when you get older or something. Uh, I have no idea. Good question, though. You stumped me. All right, we're going to count that as two questions because he stumped them. So, round of applause. <laughs> All right. All right, and, and bonus points for thanking me at the end of the side, so that gets you bonus points for anyone else presenting tonight. Uh, so next up, we've got uh, Yulia Peshkova, uh, and her presentation is from Photography to Project Management. Uh, so round of applause for Yulia. Thank you. If you don't know me, act surprised. If you don't know me, so I've been doing 
library as a photographer for the last four years. Um, and um, I've learned a lot about business through photography and things that I, I just never expected to learn from that film. And in the position of being a producer, I want to give you a, a just a tiny glance into what I do and the parallels I draw between the two fields. So first is, um, live music photography is 5% action and 95% preparation, which is really like tedious stuff that you do. It's day-to-day -day things, it's emails, it's meetings, it's negotiations, it's agreements, and that's what you do as a project manager, you just basically 95% of the time you're just like trying to make all the things line up and 5% is just the result that you get. And um, second lesson that I learned, music photography is a job. Like, musicians are actually people who have, who pursue their careers as a job. So live music photography is a job, but in this job you have to have thick skin. A personal anecdote, I went um, to a show once and I thought I was cleared and it was Aaron Lewis from Spain and I just kind of went into a pit and was ready to choreograph but was pulled out by the tour manager and said that I was not invited. So you just kind of go along with it. You acquire a lot of um, people's skills. Um, so the last lesson is Basically, everything that I learned, I had to put it to use, and it came. It, it became so useful to be a very detail-oriented project manager. Um, and then I had to think about how I did contract writing and how I negotiated and managed client relations. I did budget planning and. I learned a lot about communication design. That's how I really became passionate about design in general. And thankfully, I'm able to apply those skills in design to the job that I do every day now. But the most important thing that I learned from photography is communication with humans in the world of computers, in a competitive environment like music industry, just gets lost. And, um, it's a sign of success, of a personal success to me, to learn how to leverage human relations to make meaningful, meaningful connections that last. So, um, to finish it all up, because I want to make it short, um, I want to think about what keeps you up at night. So I listen to this one podcast, and every time it ends with the same questions, the host asks their um, guests, what keeps you up at night? And then, Every time I listen to it, I go through the list of things. So first, obviously, this presentation kept me up at night because I'm super nervous, as you can tell. <laughs> but um, I just think about the, there are so many things that I haven't learned. There are so many things that I haven't done. I haven't met so many people. I haven't been to so many places. And I'm always curious about other people. Like, what keeps you up at night? And what are the other things? things that you do outside of your job that actually make you so much more valuable than what you do in your everyday life, in 9 to 5, or whatever you do. Like most, of all, most of the people work from home nowadays and know that, but I'm super curious, so I, and I always like to meet people. That's why I do five years of time, because it pushes me outside of my comfort zone, and that's how I met a lot of people and made a lot of connections. See? Um, that's it.
I use D600 Nikon. Yeah. Yeah. All right, elaborate a little bit more. Talk to everybody from us about all the different specs of camera, oh. equipment, lighting, stand. <laughs> As in, all of this, I want to rattle off some stats. Let's go. Well, who's your favorite lens? My, my favorite? Um, 70 to 200 because of my personality. Because I just like to observe and photograph from a distance. <laughs> yep. Who's your favorite artist? My favorite artist. So, um, actually, Foles is just, they are super fun and they put on a hell of a show. And every time I see them, it's just like it's getting better and better because they they just interact with the audience and it amazes me. And where did you learn your photography skills? Um, I was fortunate enough to meet somebody through a mutual friend and she was a photographer and she opened up an internship and she was a local music photographer as well. Um, and then um, when she had to move, she just asked me if I could take over her spot. Um, so yeah, I, I just kind of Perfect. said yes. Yeah. What's your uh, most production technology? Do you use any software? Yeah. So um, by being a photographer, um, I uh, had to learn Lightroom and Photoshop. Um, and then, basically, I import all of the files right up to the show. Like, as soon as I get back to my computer, import all into Lightroom first, just to go through all the slides and choose whatever um, I'm going to use or not. And Lightroom is so great in a way that you can have presets, so you don't even have to adjust most of the time all of the like photos that you take. Uh, and everything that I take is in raw format, so you can tweak the light and the contrast and the shadows and everything basically. And then sometimes I transfer it to Photoshop just to make sure that there are some details that have to be taken out and you have to make sure that everybody looks good and pretty and you know. I just want to be the best move forward. Yeah. Alright, round of applause for you.